good morning, as it were. Freckle pasta hair. But anyways, guys, um, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to see your guys' faces here. I'm excited to see um, you guys worship the Lord. I'm excited um, that you guys are here to be encouraged um, and, and be challenged. And uh, I think I'm accurate in saying that that's the theme of Monday Night Chapel. So it is the foundation, but we also want to make sure you are encouraged. Um, you grow in your spirituality. Um, but ultimately, it's, it's a challenging night because that's the only thing that's worth value um, is when you're growing in, what you're, in your faith. And so tonight, um, we're going to continue that foundation, and as Rowan just uh, very well reminded us of, a foundation is something that you stand on. It's something that you launch from. It's your stabilizer. It is a thing that you lean on. It's a thing that you trust in so much. Parker last week um, did a great job um, explaining a product of having Christ as our foundation. The product is, in the midst of suffering, we can have hope. We can have hope in the midst of suffering because Christ is our foundation. I'm going to take a little bit different attack. I'm going to talk about how do we have Christ become more of our foundation. I think for a lot of us, um, we can say, oh yeah, Christ is my foundation, right? Um, I, I fully trust. I have a lot of faith in who he is. But I think that needs to grow. I don't think we just stop there. We don't just make this statement that, oh, Christ is my foundation, Let's be real, you're leaning on other things too. You're leaning on your parents, you're leaning on your bank account, you're leaning on your grades. Those are other parts of your foundation. I'm very much, real. that's me, exactly. Um, Christ is not my full foundation. And I think here in this life, we're growing in that. We're growing in the fact, making him more and more of a foundation. And we're going to be talking about that through, um, through this idea of faith. But first, let me pray. God, I thank you for this night. I thank you for um, this school, the school that is centered around you, Lord. I thank you for the faculty. I thank you for um, all the students here, God, as they have encouraged me and they have um, challenged me, Lord, and pointed me to you, God. I pray that you use me tonight um, as a vessel for you, not, not for my own gain, God, but for yours. I pray that people are encouraged, edified, and challenged tonight, Lord, and they are able to walk away and learn something new about you and, and, and take the next step in their faith. All right, so first let me just describe what I believe is to be faith. Um, at first, when Rowan was like, hey, can you talk about faith? I was like, yeah, I can do that. I grew up in the church. I've been taking Bible classes since eighth grade, literally. I should be able to talk about faith, right? But this is a really complicated idea. It's like, is it a noun? Is it a verb? And you know what? I'm just not even going to get into it. I'm just going to actually just make it simple. I'm going to say faith and trust are synonymous. I believe that I'm going to be using those interchangeably throughout the night, so I want you guys to keep, keep track of it, because I think we, we relate to the word trust a lot better than we relate to the word faith, because we can have trust in a chair or things of that nature, but having faith in a chair, it's kind of weird to say. So I'm going to be using that word and faith interchangeably throughout the night. But first, let me just describe faith. Who here has seen Indiana Jones movies? Raise your hand. There we go. So you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to be telling you guys about this scene. For those of you who don't know, Indiana Jones, he's this... Um, Archaeologist, that's the word I'm looking for. And he's always trying to find these artifacts. And there's one movie in particular, it's The Last Crusade. And like the climax of the movie, he is trying to get across these obstacles to go get that artifact. And there's this one point where he comes up to this place and it's this absolute trench. You can't, you can't see anything. You can't even see the bottom, it's so low. And then he looks across and he sees the door, the door where he needs to uh, get to. But it's like 50 feet away. Imagine it's like from here to the back of the room. There's no way he's going to be able to jump it. And um, the thing is, he's actually under pressure, so he can't just go back and get like, you know, some crazy ladder or anything like that. But he's, he's following this book, this guidebook that is supposed to help him in the midst of obtaining this. And he realizes, I need to have faith. And, he, and like in it, you see like this little picture of a guy like walking across this little thing. And he's like, all right, I got I to gotta trust that this is true. And what you do is you see him, he's standing there, and he's like shaking a little bit. He's a little tight. He's like freaking out. He's got a little sweat on his brow and his heart's thumping. And he just, you can see him looking straight forward. And he just sticks his foot out just like this and falls. And sure enough, he's caught. He didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't know if he was going to plummet to his death or not. But he had full faith. And I believe that is a true authentic of what 100% faith is. To be able to just jump in and say, this is what I'm counting my entire life on. I'm basing my life on this. And that is what true faith is and true trust in whatever you're tr trusting that in is. So if Christ is our foundation, and we want to trust in him, we want him to be our stabilizer, 
I think we need to believe in his promises. We need to trust that his promises are true. And the way I want to look at it tonight is by looking at two different names that we have for Jesus, and that is Savior and Lord. We're going to analyze what does it mean when Jesus is Savior? What does that mean for us as, as Christians, as people who are already believe in that, and even those for who don't believe in Jesus, don't believe that he is Savior? But also, next, what, is it, what does it mean when he's our Lord? And I think that we grow in the trust in the fact that his promises are true because his promises point to those two things, that he is our Savior and he is our Lord. It points to a lot of other things, but I'm not going to touch on those tonight. So first off, let's look at this idea of a Savior. And a Savior, the best way I can describe it without pointing to God, because I think he's the perfect example of a Savior, but who knows what a pararescue is, Yeah? Maybe not so much. But anyways, it's a special force. And their whole job for the military is to go in these dangerous zones, these war-ridden zones, and rescue people who are either dying or in absolute need of help. help. So imagine this. Imagine in the Middle East, Africa, wherever it may be, and there's dust, there's fire going around, and somebody's on the ground injured. He is utterly helpless. This guy jumps out of a plane, comes down to rescue him. He is his savior. There is nothing that that person who's on the ground, who is injured, can do anything. He is utterly helpless. He is injured. The enemy will get him. And so I think that's just a snippet of what the actual idea that Jesus is our Savior is. So because Christ even says it, and he says it in John, it says he did not come to condemn this world, but so that the world might be saved through him. So right there, that's his own uh, it's his way of just saying that I am here to save you. Um, trust me. Trust that I am your savior. And first we're going to look at a book where, um, or a passage where Paul, the author of it, is essentially correcting those who, who don't fully trust that he is their savior. Like, yeah, you know, Jesus came. He came to help, you know, but I still need to do some more things. I, I need to be good. I need to be good enough to actually achieve, achieve salvation. So if we can get the uh, slide up there, perfect. Um, we're just going to read it here. It says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. This is the only thing that I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, you're now being perfected by the flesh? So what Paul is trying to communicate here is, Jesus is not a helper. He's not. We cannot achieve anything our own. Christ's love for us is so big that he came down to do everything for us. Our little efforts, if we think, oh, God came halfway and we got to fish the other half. No, not at all. Paul's saying you're foolish to think that your imperfection, your flesh, is going to be able to accomplish what Jesus, a perfect God, a loving God, came down and did for us. I can't say this enough, but Jesus, Jesus is enough. That's as simple as that is. And it's only Jesus. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me, and the Father being God. No one ex- enters heaven except through him. So I just, I can't, I can't stress it enough that Jesus is enough. And I'll be honest, I struggled with that for a long time. I struggled with this idea. It's like, you know, I still got to be good. I still, I still got to go, go on mission trips. I got to do those things. But Christ time and time again realized, no, no, I've got it. I'm enough. Don't do those things for that reason. Do those things out of love for me. Don't do those things so you get saved. It's futile. The next thing I want to look at, so that's just kind of what a Savior is. The next thing I want to look at is a little Lord. Um... It says in Romans, it says, for those who confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe with your heart that God is raised from the dead, you will be saved. So Jesus is Lord. And let's, 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 uh, the best way I can describe Lord is someone who has authority, absolute authority. Someone who, when they say this thing, it goes. When they ask me to do something, I do without question. Um, I think guys in the military understand that a lot better than I do. They understand it because if they're, um, their general, whoever's in charge of them, says, hey, go do this? Yes, sir. That's their response. And I think that's our response to be for Jesus is. Of course, that's imperfect. it's imperfect. Um, but 
my question is, is if we're looking at the promises of Jesus and how they kind of correspond with different names, like my question for you guys is, do you trust that God will punish the wicked? Do you trust that he will have rewards for, for, for those that have done good works for him, as it says in Revelation? Do you believe that God's going to provide for you? Do you trust... Do you trust him when he says, don't store up tor- uh, uh, treasures on this earth? Does that make sense to you? Like, does it, does it, does it comp- like are you able to look at this thing and go, you know, God, I, I, I trust you in that. I trust that whatever I do on this earth isn't going to, I need to focus on you. I need to be focused eternally. All your promises to me are eternally bound. And I'm excited for that. It's like, do you trust him in that? Because I think that our actions reflect that. And the next passage we're going to look at, actually, is going to be in James. Um, James is the, the half-brother of Jesus, and, and he's writing in this particular passage. He essentially is telling people, um, if you actually have faith, it's going to be evident. And I think it's this idea is that our actions are a window into what we actually believe or to what we actually do. It's this idea of, um, I'm going to get fancy words here, so bear with me. It's operational, operational action, or sorry, Operational theology versus intellectual theology. Yeah, I can believe that if I'm doing this thing is right. Um, just so you know, I'm stealing this from somebody. I'm not this brilliant. But um, if I can believe something is true, but if I'm not doing it, then I don't actually believe it. If I believe that, my pr- that praying for people is going to heal them, but I'm not doing it, I truly don't actually believe it. And, I, and that's, that's a struggle I deal with, just so you know. But that's something I have to think about. It's like if I, if I actually believe in God's promises, my actions will reflect that. And so Paul, uh, James is actually kind of talking about that in a his, in his sense here. He says, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed, and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Paul's essentially, you're, it's bogus. Stop it. Stop fooling yourself. If you're not actually doing something, if, you're, if your actions aren't reflecting what you actually believe, you don't believe it. That faith is a bogus faith. Our actions need to reflect that. This thing keeps bumping around here. It's really fun. This is a fun noise. I think works, ooh, works and what we do with our lives are an outward expression is our faith and our trust that God's promises are true. And I know I've been kind of talking about this thing, I've been kind of heavy on you guys, like, oh, if you're not working, if you're not doing these works, that, you know, works are a product of your faith, then, oh, do you not have faith? No, I'm not saying you don't have faith. I'm not saying you don't trust God. Um, I'm just saying it needs to grow. That's all I'm saying. And I think that that's something we need to aspire to. And I'll be the first to admit, my faith isn't perfect. There's no way I'd be able to do this number on God. There's no way. I'm not perfect at all. Um, But I think that God is patient with us. I think that he he comes alongside alongside of us. He doesn't expect us to fully trust him right off the bat. He expects us to grow in that. I think he calls to that frequently. So maybe, maybe you guys are struggling over here with this idea that Jesus is Savior. Maybe you're like, hey, you know, like I was and still to this day have a couple times, like I, I'll kind of relapse in that. But like maybe, maybe God didn't actually do everything. Maybe he wasn't enough. Maybe God isn't even a Savior at all. Well, I guess my suggestion for you to grow in your trust in the fact that he is your Savior so that he can become more of a foundation for you is to be relational with him. If you don't, if you see somebody walking on the side of the street, you don't trust them. You don't know their name. You don't know their character. You don't know if they love you. They don't, you don't, they don't, you don't know anything about them. So I can't expect you guys to trust that God is your savior unless you don't know who he is. Unless you don't understand his, his, his care for you, his absolute love and, and adoration for you. I want you to also ask somebody. 
especially if you don't even know of him, especially if he's not your savior at all. I want you to ask somebody. I want you to dive into scripture here, see what this says about him. It's an amazing thing said about him here. And I think if we understand more about who he is, more about his heart for us, we will be able to relinquish more trust and more faith and be able to give more of our foundation to the Father as he, as he reveals more of himself to us through people, through asking questions, through diving into his word. Maybe you guys have been a Christian for a long time, but he's, not, and he's your savior, but he's not necessarily your Lord. And I think this is something we can all grow in as the last one, but specifically this one. I think that it is is crucial for us that he becomes more and more of our Lord. I can tell you this right now, he is not fully my Lord because every time I sin, that's my saying, I don't trust you, God. I'd rather rather lie right now, even though your promises say that it leads to destruction. I'd um, I'd rather lust right now because I want that gratification right now, right? That's me not trusting in him, not trusting in his promises. I also think that if we are going to get to know him, be able to trust him, it's this, it's this idea that we, he, he is patient with us and he reveals more of himself to you. I think of Abraham, who's the father of our faith, right? And you look at most New Testament authors, they're going to point to him if they're going to say, yeah, he's, he's, he's the guy we need to look to if we want to learn about faith. God slowly reveals his character to, to Abraham. He doesn't just go, boom, trust me. And then later on, you see, you see him always introduce himself. He always introduces himself. He goes, I am the father, or sorry, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the one that pulled you out of Egypt. So Jesus, or God, always reminds us of who he is because he wants us to trust him in a relational way. And I think that right there reveals a lot, of, uh, a lot about his character. And I think that, how, how do we grow when it comes to uh, trusting in God as our Lord? Um, I think we can look at Hebrews 11, for instance. It's this, uh, this, big, this, this huge, long chapter where the author of Hebrews, who knows who it is, um, essentially just goes to the Old Testament and says, this is what this person did through faith, and this person did this through faith. And over and over again, the list is huge. I could, I, we'd be here for all night if I was going to talk through the whole thing. And I think it's just time and time again, God's proving his faithfulness. He's giving you reason to trust him. And I think that this, this, this book gives us reason to trust him as our Lord. But what do we do? What do we do to actually grow in that trust? Because I don't fully trust him yet, and I know you don't either. But how do we do that? We, we slowly relinquish things to him. We do baby steps. It's this idea of, of, of you know, taking one little step at a time, you know? There's no way you're going to be able to jump across the whole gap. It actually reminds me of um, when I used to be a high adventure guide. And you'd have kids, these come up in these trees, and they'd be terrified. You see the look in their face. They don't trust the equipment. They don't trust that if they were going to fall, it's going to catch them. Me being up there, experiencing it, actually allowing it to prove to me that it's going to be other. I trusted it. And this is just a minor example, but it's gonna, I think it paints the picture what I would tell the kids, they'd be like, hey, you know, they're terrified. I'd be like, hey, can I, can, I, can, I have you, can I have you do something for me? They're like, yeah, yeah, what can I do? I go, I don't expect you to come across this cable yet. All right, well, okay, that, that kind of comforts them. What I want you to do is I want you to grab on your tethers, and I want you to try to hang from them just for a little bit. Just hang on them. And, you know, see, they, they'd freak out, but they'd hang on them. And I think that they're slowly relinquishing. They're slowly giving it. Even though they're over the platform, they're giving it reason. They're allowing it to give reason to trust it. And then what I would do is I would have them come out on the cable after they've got comfortable with that, and I would have them just sit down. Just sit down in their harness and let the harness carry them. And I think that that's the next step. That is the next step in trusting in the equipment. And then if they're really bold and I think that they'd be able to do it, I'd ask them to jump. Just to straight up jump off and kind of flail in the air to an extent and that is when I know they have trust. And they'll be able to go through that so easily. And I think that's just such a minor example. It's just, a, just a, like a three-step process to trusting in something. But I think there's much more of that, much more complex. So I guess my question for you guys tonight is, 
what is it in your life that you can look back on because I truly believe God's plan only makes sense in hindsight? I look back at my life, I go, I'm super frustrated in this area or whatever, but then I go look back and I go, okay, it makes sense, God, thanks. But what, what, what can you look back in your life and go, yeah, God was faithful. God fulfilled his promise here. How can I be encouraged in that to trust him more? And then my next question for you guys is, what can you relinquish a little bit to God? What can you trust him with? Is it tithing? Is it your words? I think that's very important, guys. I just want you, I want to encourage you guys to take that next step. And this is something that I've kind of thought about for a little bit, and I think that as we gain in our trust, we, we become less focused on here. And by here, I mean the world. I mean our time here spent on earth. And we become more focused on the eternal, more focused on what God's going to do, what God's going to accomplish here on earth. And... I think when our faith graduates from, you know, holding on to the tethers to sitting in it to fully jumping off, our prayers become less and less about, hey, God, can you provide for me this way? To more of, God, will your kingdom come? Will your will be done? And I think that's, the, and, and I don't expect you to be there. I'm not there. I'll be honest. I'm not. But I think that that's a marker because I know a man who is incredibly faithful. He's the most faithful man I know. And I've never heard him complain. I've never heard him be like, you know, God needs to step in in this area. Every time I talk to him, he's like, praise God, eternal things are being changed. Lives are being changed. His whole life is about the eternal. He recognizes our time here is, is, is so temporary. His trust is so big, I don't even understand. His faith is so huge, I don't understand it. And I just hope one day I can have that faith. So our foundation really matters. I want to encourage you guys Work towards the goal of giving full, uh, full trust in God. Work towards that goal of having foundation. I want you guys to taste and see that the Lord is good, as a psalm says. I think that's beautiful. You can't just sit there and expect God to do it. You have to go and taste it. It's an action. Do something about it. Grow in your faith. Don't expect an enlightenment to you. So tonight, guys, um, we're going to do something we've done before. Um, I want the RAs and anyone on the prayer team, I want you guys to kind of circle around the room. Um, and I want this next couple moments for us to, to just pray and, and, and like analyze our lives. What is, the, what is that next step? What is that thing that I need to slowly relinquish control to? What's that next baby step? Is it sitting in the harness? Is it jumping? Is it just pulling on my tethers? What is that next step? I want you guys to analyze that. And then secondly, too, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I know most of my sermon tonight was just kind of speaking at those who have faith. If you don't actually know him and don't know him as your Savior, I want you to dive into this. Go see for yourself. Ask your friends. There's, to ask your RAs. I know your RAs. They, they love him. They know him. They know him as their Savior. And just rely on that because there's nothing more freeing knowing that it is nothing that I do, it is only what Christ has done for me that I can now live in peace and harmony. So let's pray.